Thank you, thank you, Anne, and thank you very much for having me here. Uh, it's, it's an honor. This is my second year speaking here. Uh, I enjoy the crowd and I enjoy this place, and I want to thank my wife as well for coming up, and she's my number one fan. So, um, as Dr. Ann said, I am a um, rehabilitation physician. I've, I practice physical medicine and rehabilitation. I also practice functional medicine, and the style that I practice is what I call integrative rehabilitation medicine. It really is incorporating all of the things that us as osteopaths have learned or should have learned into helping patients heal and helping patients improve their function. So we're going to talk about optimizing healing with diet, exercise, and m the mind as well. Um, I do not have any financial disclosures, but I'm, I'm, I'm open to suggestions. <laughs> um, so as an integrative rehabilitation doctor, my goal is to help my patients improve their function and return to their function. So I see patients who have been injured or patients who are going to have surgery. And my, my, my place is kind of right in between. That, that arrow, that's where, I, that's where I function. I try to get my patients from an injury state to a functional state and hopefully decrease their pain and improve their lifestyle. And that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about can, can lifestyle actually improve their function? Can it improve their healing? Can your diet, can your exercise program, can your mental well-being actually make a difference in how you're going to heal? So we're going to start off with some basics. Uh, tissue damage does happen. We all have it. Who, who knows somebody who has not had an injury or who has not ever had an injury, right? We all have had injuries. We all will have injuries and we all have patients that have injuries, you know, shoulder pain, uh, fractures, even surgeries. And we can make a change. We can, we can actually help this, these patients heal better. So let's talk about injury. There's typically four basic tissues that are, in, that are involved in injury. Uh, your epithelial tissue, your connective tissue, which are the tendons, ligaments, bone, cartilage. And that's where we're going to focus our time today is on the connective tissue healing, on muscles and nerves as well. So let's look at connective tissue a little bit deeper because this is, this is what we learn as osteopaths, right? We all learn about fascia. Who, who's remember in medical school? Fascia. That was one of my favorite words as a med medical student, learning about fascia and how we can integrate our hands into helping fascia. But connective tissue is made up of typically three components. The fibers, the ground substance, kind of the filler, and then the cells. And then there's a stimulus for connective tissue healing. It's mechanical, biochemical, energetic, genetic, and also mental. So I'm going to let you kind of challenge you to think about how your mind can stimulate growth and repair. So looking at connective tissue, the fibrous components, collagen, is, the, is about 70 to 90 percent of connective tissue. And we need to remember this. This is very important for the rest of this lecture. Collagen is, is, is kind of the main, the most abundant protein in our body. It's going to be one of the most important proteins when we are trying to heal. This is the protein uh, that people with EDS of high, or hypermobility tissues are, are not able to, to produce appropriately, and then they have a hard time healing. Uh, collagen is, is a bunch of amino acids wound up in a triple helix, the kind of cross-linked, but all of that has specific requirements like copper, iron, vitamin C. Uh, different types of collagen exist. You've got type 1 and type 2 uh, as your ligaments and tendons, and you have your uh, type 3 in, in some of the cartilages. And collagen is, is, is nice wavy lines of tissue that's supposed to be well organized. And we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. When collagen is well organized, we heal well, our tissues become strong. When collagen is not well organized, we don't heal well and then the tissues are frail. Uh, ligaments also have some elastin in it, which gives them some st stretchability. But again, another important point, synthesis, synthesis of collagen requires energy, requires amino acids, right, the building blocks, and lots of nutrients like magnesium, zinc, iron. So we're going to talk about that, you know, how the, do those play in your patient's healing. And then the other part of the connective tissue is the ground substance, kind of the filler, right, the matrix. This is the water, the different proteins, the proteoglycans, glycosaminoglycans. Those are, you know, who's heard of these? Chondroitin, hyaluronic acid, right? These are the things that we give our patients in supplements or sometimes inject in their knees. Well, this is all stuff that's inside the, the, the connective tissue that's filling in. And then the minerals, right? We need the magnesiums, calciums. 
And then you have the working cells, the stem cells. One of my favorite cells is the fibroblast, right? Fibroblast makes the collagen. It, it produces collagen, breaks down some of the bad things, and creates the good things. These are some of my favorite cells, and I want you to pay attention again. So we talked about collagen is going to be important. Fibroblasts are going to be very important for the rest of this lecture. Other cells are osteoblasts, osteoclasts, and some immune cells. These are all very important cells that need to function properly for proper healing. When these cells don't function, we don't heal well. So when we get injured or when we have surgery, there's specific stages of healing that, pe that we go through. First there's that injury, then there's that inflammatory stage, and then you have that proliferative phase where all those cells come in and start laying down the collagen. And then you have the remodeling phase where everything gets nice and strong. And all of those phases are very important. We need to move through those phases very properly and at, at a timely manner. And if we get stuck in one of them, we don't heal very well. And very often we have patients that are stuck in that inflammatory phase. They never move forward to the proliferative, and that's where we see the chronic pain patients. So are your patients healing at their maximal potential? You know, are, are we doing everything that we can to help them heal? Can lifestyle, can diet, exercise, and mental well-being, can that actually affect the way they're going to heal? So um, I was talking to Dr. N before, you know, we are DOs, there's the DO difference. According to the AOA, this is a quote from AOA, we are the guardians of wellness, right? Uh, we, we like to look at and take a deeper understanding of our lifestyle and environment, our holistic, empathetic approach to medicine. We promote the body's natural tendency to healing and self-regeneration. That's what we do as osteopaths, and we cannot forget that. That's what we learned in medical school, that's what we keep on learning, and that's what we keep on practicing and teaching to our patients. So let's look at nutrition. How can nutrition actually affect your healing? You know, can what you eat, can your diet make a difference? How your wound is going to heal, how your tendons are going to heal, how your spine is going to heal after surgery. So we're going to look at the macronutrients, the energy, the proteins, the fats, the carbohydrates, and we're going to look at some micronutrients, the vitamins and the minerals that are involved in healing and that are necessary for optimal healing. So when you injure yourself or when you have surgery, you need energy. Your, your metabolic rate increases. Your energy demands increase. So for collagen synthesis, you need a lot of energy for those fibroblasts. You need a lot of energy to put down those fibers. Even short-term fasting during healing can actually decrease your ability to heal. So someone who's got post-operative healing to do, their, their basic metabolic rate may go up up to 15% more. After a fracture, 20 to 25% increase in your basic metabolic rate. So you need a lot of energy. And unfortunately, we see a lot of energy deficiency. We see a lot of protein deficiency. We see a lot of food nutritional deficiency. So malnutrition is actually very common in the community. There's multiple studies that looked at patients going through hip replacements, spinal infusions, 12 to 50% of these people were malnourished. These were not cancer patients. These were not, you know, anything else, any special patients. These are regular patients going into surgery, 50, up to 50% of them are malnourished. So where, we get, where do we get our energy, right? Macronutrients, let's look at the proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. And we're gonna see a little bit about proteins. So proteins are converted into the amino acids, and remember, we need the amino acids to create the collagen, right? To create uh, the connective tissue. They're the building blocks. Uh, they're also a great energy source when we need that energy source. And then during healing, we actually have an increased requirement for, for protein. Our typical requirement for protein is about a half a, half a gram to 0.75 grams per kilogram. But when we are injured and we are healing, that goes up to 1 to 1 1.5 grams per kilogram. So that, that is needed. And everyone always tells me, oh, well, I'm eating my protein. I'm eating my burgers and my meats. Well, protein comes in many ways, right? Vegetarians still get protein. There's plant protein, you can get nine grams of protein from a half a cup of lentils, right? You can get eight grams of protein from a cup of quinoa. So you gotta get just a little bit of everything. You know, you can get plant protein, animal protein, as long as you get enough for your healing and your patients get enough. So protein, the amino acids are the building blocks, right? There's the essential proteins, and then there's the non-essential amino acids. And actually, the new term, the more accepted term, is the conditionally essential amino acids. So the essential amino acids are the ones that we cannot produce, and we need to get them from our diet. The non-essential or the conditionally essential amino acids, we, our body can produce, but during healing or during injury, they're conditionally essential, meaning our body, body can't keep up, and we need to increase our intake to allow the body to actually heal. And you can get complete protein from animal sources, or you can also get them from plant sources. But 
There's a protein digestibility corrected amino acid score, which means, yes, you can get some complete proteins from plant sources, but it's a little bit harder for us to digest and draw out those proteins. So that's why I always tell my patients, we need a little bit of both just to, to uh, give you enough of those amino acids to heal. So some conditionally essential amino acids have been studied, and there's many of them, uh, like arginine. Arginine is a big one. It's needed for collagen synthesis. Again, I remember, remember I told you, collagen is very important for healing. It's synthesized in good amount when you're not healing, but when you're healing, we need more of this stuff. And then actually studies looking at supplementation of arginine have shown to increase collagen and total protein laydown in, in wounds and stimulate actually immune cells. Next conditionally amino acid is glutamine. Glutamine is actually needed for fibroblasts. Again, my favorite cells needed for healing. It's needed by macrophages, lymphocytes. It's needed for proliferation. And it's needed to stimulate that early inflammatory response. Remember, we needed that early inflammatory response to start healing. Sometimes people don't mount it in early inflammatory response, and we'll talk about that. And they can't stimulate a healing response. Very necessary for synthesis of collagen and DNA. And also leaky gut. So very often we see patients uh, that are in a major trauma or in a hospital, they develop leaky gut because uh, glutamine is one of the main food sources for our enterocytes. Our, enter our, our gut cells, our enterocytes, need glutamine to be able to stay alive. And when we are in an injured state, like a trauma, the glutamine is used up for recovery, and very often these patients develop leaky gut, which can cause a lot of things, you know, sepsis even. So protein deficiency is common, and the, the risks are malnutrition, which we see. We see our, our elderly patients eat toast and coffee for breakfast, and maybe a salad for, for lunch, and maybe some bread for, you know, for dinner. You know, this is very common. So these restrictive diets, malabsorption, people that are on acid-blocking medi me medications, or people that have had gastric surgeries, this, these people have protein deficiency. And deficiency signs and symptoms, delayed healing, right? We're talking about healing. Uh, slow proliferation of fibroblasts, slow production of collagen. These people cannot make enough of this collagen to heal. Increased edema. And then sometimes people call, uh, discuss about having fatigue, brain fog, frail hair. Protein deficiency has been shown to impair healing in spinal surgeries. So in patients undergoing elective lumbar surgeries in this one study, 25% were protein deficiency. They had about 46 post-surgical patients with complications, and about 85% of them actually were deficient in, in protein. This is common. This happens, and it can affect how people will heal from surgery or from any other injury. So I tell my patients, drink bone broth. Who's made bone broth in the past? Or who's ever told their patients to make bone broth? My wife makes the most amazing bone broth. She cooks it for about 48 hours. She puts some chicken feed and some other bones and cooks it for about 40, 48 hours. And then we put some vegetables and we drink it. We put it in our lunch. We put it in our soups. Very high in amino acids as the proline, lysine, glutamine, arginine. We just talked about these. These are essentially or conditionally essential amino acids. They have the glycosaminoglycans, right? The hyaluronic acid, the chondroitin. After drinking bone broth, your peak plasma concentration is about one or two hours, and it's just bathing your tissue, right? You're just bathing tissue with bone broth. Collagen synthesis is significantly increased after getting these, these amino acids, right? Synthesis of the extracellular matrix, we talked about this. This is what makes up the connective tissue. This is what we need to heal. We also need fats, right? You know, who, who's on a fat, low-fat diet, right? We know that that was a fad, and that went... They're pretty sour. I think last year there was a, um, uh, a, a statement by the American College of Cardiology that, hey, we, hey guess what? Actually, low-fat diets are not as healthy as we thought. They're actually bad. There's a lot of issues that happen with low-fat diets. People within 10 to 14 days on a low-fat diet can actually have fatty acid, or I'm sorry, essential fatty acid deficiency. We need these for prostaglandin synthesis. We need to make these inflammatory markers to stimulate inflammation and healing. When we don't have enough fat, we can't stimulate these. And also a great source of energy as well. And then we have carbohydrates, and carbohydrates are needed for energy. But in this country, we do not have a carbohydrate deficiency. We actually have the opposite, right? We have a, 
access. We have access of carbohydrates, right? It's hyperglycemia. Everybody has hyperglycemia in, in, you know, in actually most of my patients, right? And hyperglycemia very negatively affects your healing. It slows down that initial inflammatory response. It slows down the immune cells, inhibits fibroblasts. My favorite cells get inhibited by, by uh, hyperglycemia. So again, I don't tell my patients to eat more carbohydrates. I just tell them, let's go from simple to complex carbohydrates. Let's have some more greens. Let's put some vegetables on your plate. So I tell my patients about the Mediterranean diet. It's one of my favorite diets. It's one that I recommend as our core food plan. We have a lot of different diets in my clinic, uh, a lot of specialized diets, but this is typically our, our startup diet. And this is what you know, the Harvard School of Public Health and the World Health Organization promotes as the healthy diet. A good amount of protein, good amount of fats, lots of carbo or a good amount of good complex carbohydrates. And then you see the bottom of that, of that little pyramid. Dr. and I were just talking about that. Do you see the bottom of that pyramid? What does it show? People enjoying their food with their family members, right? Connecting. Food is connection. So, you know, teach your patients also. Eat dinner with your families. I always, when I come home, I have dinner with my wife and my son. We sit down, we look at the sun, sunset, and we, we enjoy ourselves. Water break. We need water, right? Like I said, our, our cells, our connective tissues need water. Uh, Unfortunately, most of our patients are dehydrated. How many, of your, how many know of your patients that are dehydrated? What do you think? Do you think your patients are actually dehydrated? How many have dehydrated patients in their clinic? All of us. We live in Florida. They're all dehydrated, right? We need lots of fluids. We need fluids to, to heal, you know, especially if we're putting them on a higher protein diet to heal. They will need more fluid for the blood volume, for the nutrients delivery. So I usually tell my patients, take your weight in pounds, take it in half, and that's your ounces of water that you need per day. So if you have, you know, you're a 160-pound person, they're going to need about 80 ounces of water per day. And who's at risk of de dehydration? We are, right? Floridians, high temperature, high protein diets. Elderly, they actually don't, don't they can't concentrate their urine. They have an altered thirst perception, so they don't drink as much. Every day I ask my elderly patients, how, many, how much do you drink? Well, I have some coffee and I have a glass of water. And that's it. But my joints hurt. I'm not healing. Well, these people are dry, right? They're on medications that dry them out as well. So, you know, tell them eight to ten cups of water or half of your weight in ounces. Then we need vitamins, right? We need lots of vitamins. Vitamins, uh, we're going to talk about the A, B's, and C's and vitamins. So vitamin A, very crucial. It's one of those fat-soluble vitamins. Again, people with a low-fat diet usually are deficient. You can get it from beef liver, sweet potatoes, carrots, spinach. Uh, retinol and beta-carotene are a little bit different. Retinol is found in animal products. Beta-carotene is the pre-vitamin A, and your body has to convert it to retinol, and the retinol is the active hormone. It's actually a hormone. It's a regulatory hormone for your skin, bone, cartilage. It is important for cell differentiation and growth, and also synthesis of the hyaluronic acid and the chondroitin, right, the filler. We're always going back to that connective tissue. These, this, this stuff is important to even lay down the connective tissue. Deficiency symptoms, usually I ask my patients, do you have any night blindness? Night blindness is a great giveaway. If people have night blindness, vitamin deficiency, you, you can always test them for that. But they have decreased fibroblast activity, decreased wound healing, increased chondro chondroitin sulfate turnover, bone loss. And who's at risk? People after trauma, restrictive diets like the low-fat diet, the elderly, corticosteroids. Corticosteroids actually antagonize retinal effect. So people on corticosteroids very often have a functional vitamin A deficiency. And about 20% of the U.S. population consumes less than 70% of the recommended daily allowance. This is common. Vitamin B, B vitamins. We have a whole array of B vitamins, very important. Uh, they come from a real foods, the greens, the vegetables. Vitamin B12 is the only one that is found in animal products. So that's the one that usually we have to test for, with our patients who are vegetarian. They're usually, they may be deficient. All the other B vitamins you can get from your real foods. And B vitamins, what's their role in healing? Well, we need them for energy. Remember the fibroblasts need a lot of energy to heal. Uh, well, vitamin B vitamins are necessary. They're necessary to actually break down the foods and, and, and take out the energy from the foods. They're important for cell proliferation and collagen linking and uh, cross-linking. So deficiency symptoms, decreased wound strength, right? Decreased healing, defective collagen production, the position and maturation of collagen is def def deficient. Osteoporosis, weakness, neuropathy. We always think about vitamin B deficiency and neuropathy, but 
your patients that are not healing well. They could be deficient in B vitamins, not just B12, B1, B2, B5, B6. I test usually for all of those if I feel it's necessary. Risk of deficiency, trauma, malabsorption. You know, how many of your patients are on acid-blocking medications? Yeah, well, guess what? We need acid to break down the proteins, break down the foods, and absorb B vitamins and absorb proteins. Very often people on acid-blocking medications are vitamin B deficient and other deficiencies. Uh, restrictive diets, uh, alcoholism drains your body of B vitamins. Vitamin C, another one of those, one of my favorite vitamins, that are rec rec require daily allowances about 90 milligrams per day. But during healing or trauma, it goes up to about 2,000 because we need that vitamin C to, to stimulate that fibroblast, to stimulate the collagen uh, cross-linking. It actually is involved in shaping the collagen, right? We talked about the collagen being a triple helix of fibers. Well, vitamin C is involved to, in, into making that triple helix. Without it, you cannot make a very good collagen. It's also needed to stimulate the fibroblasts, right? My favorite cells and osteoblasts and chondrocytes. And deficiency symptoms, and we see this all the time, frail collagen, right? Frail collagen, scurvy, decreased fibroblast function, decreased scar formation, joint and bone pain, muscular weakness. So usually we see these patients that have low petechiae, uh, gingival hypertrophy and bleeding. If, they, if you see that on your patients, these patients could be vitamin C deficient. And who's at risk? Again, tra post-trauma, smokers, alcoholics, the standard American diet. I, I love this, sad, it's so perfect. Malabsorption and then diabetics. Deficiency in the land of access. We live in the land of access, right? Unfortunately, we live in a land of deficiency. We don't want to admit it, but it's common. So in 2003 and 2004, they tested throughout America, the National Health Association study, um, 7,000 patients or people, and about 7% of them were actually vitamin E deficient. And it was worse in the low income group and in smokers. Another study in Britain found the same thing, 6%. So it's, it's worldwide deficiency. And what were the symptoms? Decreased healing. Hey, we're trying to get our patients to heal, but if they don't have vitamin C, they will not. Fragility, bone pain, bleeding, emotional changes. So I don't tell my patients, hey, let's go get a bunch of vitamin C. I tell them, let's make a green smoothie. My wife and I, we make a green smoothie every day. My seven and a half year old son drinks a green smoothie. He says, thank you, daddy. It was delicious. Right? We can teach our patients and our kids and ourselves to drink a green smoothie. You put some kale, some pineapple, some blueberries. Usually I put a little bit of lemon and some banana to help with the flavor. And I like to add some anti-inflammatories like ginger and turmeric seeds and roots and some seeds. And we'll talk about seeds, what's the importance there. So let's talk about minerals now. Minerals are also extremely important for healing and for life, right? We have, we have rocks in our system. We are made of stardust. Right? We are made of all this other stuff around us, and it's, it's in us. Calcium, magnesium, zinc, these are all metals that are actually found within us. So let's talk about calcium. Calcium is the most abundant cation in our body. 99% of it is found in the bone, uh, but it's also found in fluids and cells, and we can get it in tofu, we can get it in greens, spinach. So you know, people think, oh, I get calcium because I drink milk. Well, you can get a lot of calcium from greens, yogurt, seeds, sardines. There's a lot of places. You don't have to have milk and cheese for, um, for your calcium. A lot of my patients tend to be sensitive to dairy and to, to milk and cheese. A lot of us don't digest it very well, so I usually don't tell them eat more dairy, eat more greens, eat more seeds and sardines. So calcium is involved in bone matrix formation, it's involved in muscle contraction, it's involved in nerve impulses, cell membrane maintenance, and deficiency symptoms, and we see this all the time, bone loss, skeletal fragility, again, fragility, this word keeps on popping up with these deficiencies, right? We want tissue to be strong and healthy and healing, but these deficiencies cause fragility. Muscle weakness, altered nerve functions, I see this all the time in my patients. One of my favorite minerals is magnesium, uh, magnesium is found in bone, but it's also found in muscles. Uh, and we can get magnesium again from greens, spinach, Swiss chard, pumpkins and se pumpkin seeds and sesame seeds. We should just be eating greens and seeds every day, all day, all day long, right? Avocados, bananas, and even dark chocolate. I have patients who tell me, I had my magnesium today. I had some dark chocolate. Mmm, that magnesium was delicious. Sure. So what's its role in healing? It's a cofactor, more than 300 different enzymes. It's needed for cellular energy. It's involved in protein synthesis. 
It drives the calcium into bones. So you can take all the calcium you want to your body. If you don't have magnesium in your body, if you're magnesium deficient, that calcium is not going to be driven into the bones, and your bones are going to be weak. It activates different hormones. It stimulates osteoblasts. osteoblasts. So magnesium deficiency, again, is very common. About 50% of the U.S. population consumes then le less than 250 milligrams of the RDA. And that's, we need about 320 to 420 milligrams per day, right? And what are the symptoms? I see this every day. Fatigue, muscle weakness, numbness, tingling, muscle cramps, skeletal fragility. There's that word again, fragile tissues and impair, impaired bone growth. Zinc is one of, another one of those minerals that's very important. We're going to discuss its role, but it's a transitional metal. It's also found in muscles and bones. And you can get zinc from a lot of different foods. You can get it from oysters if you have oysters once a week, it's probably, you have your serving of, your weekly serving of zinc, okay, 74 milligrams per three ounces of oysters. Uh, you get it in beef, lamb, sesame seeds, pumpkins, again, those seeds are very important, that's why I put them in my smoothie every day. Even spinach and mushrooms, they all have a little bit of zinc. And what's its role? It activates different enzymes that are necessary for healing. It's involved in the DNA, RNA synthesis. It actually utilized, it's utilized by the fibroblasts to make protein and collagen, right? Collagen, my favorite word again. And then calcium absorption and, in, and making the, the calcium actually absorbed into the bones, right? Without zinc, again, all the calcium you want, if you don't have zinc, you will not, put, you will not absorb it into your bones. There's actually studies looking at zinc for healing. There was a randomized controlled trial for 60 patients who had traumatic bone fractures, and they were put on zinc supplements. I'm not telling you to put your patients on zinc supplements, but here's a study because we have to blind everybody, right? We can't just give everybody oysters. Um, and they actually showed that they have increased rate of callus formation and bone healing on x-rays. Okay, and multiple studies show that it improves wound epithelialization and it, healing and it decreases wound infections. So oysters and, and, and seeds and zinc is very important for our healing. And deficiency symptoms, again, impaired wound healing, impaired bone healing, immune deficiency, hypogonadism, so you're not making enough testosterone. And I usually see these patients have a little bit of angular stomatitis, which is a little redness around their, their mouth. You can also see periorifacial dermatitis. If you see this in your patients, think about it. Could they be zinc deficient? And it's scary, but 35 to 45% of adults over 60 are deficient. They take in less than what's recommended. So risk of deficiency, again, trauma, burns, processed foods, poor crops. We live in a land of deficiency, unfortunately. Our crops are not as, as, as efficient as uh, grabbing those minerals from the, from the soil because there is not, not much there. So again, poor diets, malabsorption, again, IBS, IBD, hypochlorohydia, which is another fancy word. I do not have enough stomach acid to break down these minerals. Chronic alcohol use, excessive exercising, unfortunately, pregnancy as well. So again, I don't tell my patients, take all these minerals. I tell them, drink a green smoothie and add some nuts and seeds to them and some water and some lemon and you're set. That is, that is food as medicine, right? Your smoothie or your patient's smoothie could be their medicine. Isn't that much cooler instead of taking a bunch of pills? Hey, here's my green smoothie. That's my medicine this morning. I do that every day for myself and I do that every day with my patients. Deficiency in the land of excess, right? What are your patients eating? Look at this kid. What the heck is he eating, okay? And he's reaching for more of it, okay? This is too common, and it's scary. It's scary. It's, it's there. So I do test sometimes patients for nutritional deficiency. Obviously, the history and physical exam is the most important. But you can get some labs. You can look at the serum albumin, lymphocyte count. I like micronutrient testing. Who's heard of micronutrient testing? Or who's done micronutrient testing? Very nice test. You can get, send, your, send it to different labs. There's lots of different labs that do it. And it tells you, it tells you pretty much all the vitamins and minerals that are found in the patients. And, and you can then work on them. Okay, maybe we need to change these foods or maybe maybe a little supplement. But again, focusing on foods. So I'm not telling you to tell, put all your patients on minerals and vitamin supplements. You know, who's, who's read this book, Whole, by Dr. Colin Cam Campbell? Right? He talks about, hey, we, we don't need, really need all these supplements. We, we really just need to eat real food. You know, 100 grams of an apple, which has only about 5.7 milligrams of vitamin C, has equivalent effect as 1, 1,500 milligrams of vitamin C supplementation. Equivalent effect as far as its antioxidant content, because all those vitamins and minerals are coming with this array of other stuff. So it's not just, I need vitamin C, I need zinc. We need everything 
that's all included in our real foods, right? I tell my patients to jerf. Who knows what jerf is, right? Just eat real food, right? Mostly plants, not too much. That's what Michael Pollan said, right? So I tell my patients, eat an you know, array of color. Look at that. I, tell, I teach my patients, does your plate look like a rainbow, right? We should eat a rainbow. How was your rainbow today? Did you eat your rainbow, okay? So I actually went to uh, my son's school, and I taught the kids about the rainbow. We were talking about phytonutrients. At the end of the day, they were all saying, phytonutrients. It was beautiful. These are second graders, right? We were, I was teaching them, and this, there's a little form that I had them fill out. This is how many reds I ate today. This is how many greens I ate. This is how many oranges I ate. And they were doing that for the whole week. And at the end, the, 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 their teacher gave them a prize, whoever filled out all of them. Hopefully, they weren't cheating. I know my son wasn't, because every day, he's got all of his greens. He's got a rainbow on his plate every day. Do you? Right? Do you have a rainbow on your plate? Did you have a rainbow for your breakfast today? I tried my best, and, I, I, you know, and our breakfast here was a little bit limited. So I had my oatmeal, but I put some pineapple, I put some, some melon, I put some nuts and seeds, right? Uh, it was pretty close to a rainbow. And then I asked, waiter, can I please get some avocados and tomatoes? And boy, I had a rainbow on my plate, right? I challenge you to do the same. So let's switch gears a little bit now to exercise. You know, how can exercise actually have an effect on our healing? What do you guys think? I mean, most people think it's a no-brainer, but I'll show you. I'll show you some of the science behind it, right? So exercise has been shown to actually accelerate wound healing. This is a very nice study looking at 24 sedentary patients, sedentary adults, and they were randomized to either an exercise group or a non-exercise group. And it was just three times a week, an hour of exercise, some aerobic exercise, some strengthening exercise, and then the control was to ask not to do anything different, right? And after one month, they had a little punch biopsy. So I'm sure they had to pay them some money to, to allow for a punch biopsy. But they all got a punch biopsy. And then starting one week after that, they had digital photographs three times a week. And they were looking at whose wounds are going to completely heal and how fast does it take. Very interesting. Look at the exercise group. The exercise group is in the black. Those are the black bars. At, day th at week three, um, about 19 or 18 percent of these patients were completely healed. The other ones weren't. At week four, 55 of the exercise, 55 percent of the exercise group was completely healed. The other one just barely, just barely starting to heal. Right. At week five, you know, 82 percent of these patients are, are, are almost are completely healed. The other guys are just catching up, and everyone healed by week seven. But look how quicker the exercise group healed their wound. Why? What, what's going on? What does exercise do? You know, who's heard of stem cell therapy or who, who's, you know, our patients are asking, I'm going to go and pay $10,000 for stem cell therapy. And I tell them, I'm going to go exercise and I'm going to do some stem cell ther therapy for myself. Okay. Exercise stimulates stem cells, right? Exercise increases circulating stem cells. There's multiple mechanisms that have been shown to do that. It activates the, the stem cells. It increases their mobilization. So there are studies looking at actually stem cell mobilization. So it takes the stem cells from the bone marrow and they start circulating after exercise. And they proliferate, they differentiate. And there's different types of exercises that do it better than others. We find that the more strenuous, the more anaerobic exercises tend to stimulate more stem cells than, than the aerobic. But any kind of exercise stimulates stem cells. So I. I practice stem cell therapy with my patients. I tell them, go exercise. Exercise also makes a difference how you load that tissue, right? It stimulates different growth factors. Loading the actual collagen, loading the cells, stimulates uh, the fibroblasts, stimulates those stem cells to actually lay down the, the, the increase the collagen concentration, increase the protein synthesis. Uh, it actually improves the matrix collagen organization. So, when my patients are healing from an injury, I always tell them, you know, work out a little bit. We have them do some physical therapy, enough to stimulate that healing. We don't want to overdo it because we don't want to tear the new tissue. But when you actually exercise and stimulate the tissue, there's multiple chemical effects, multiple mechanical effects, and actually electric effects that happen. And it lays down that collagen into straight lines, right? When you don't load the tissue, the collagen becomes disorganized. And then you form scar tissue that's not, not very strong. And then this tissue becomes frail. So loading tissue is extremely important to kind of show the body, hey, these are the lines of stress. And this is not just for, for, um, for ligaments and tendons, even skin. Loading the skin a little bit has been shown to improve wound strength and collagen formation in the right, right, right organization. So lack of tissue loading does the opposite, right? If these patients are healing from an injury and they do nothing, their collagen is going to look disorganized. Look at this picture over here. The one on the right is organized. The one on the left is disorganized collagen. 
Okay? This is what happens when you don't load tissue, when you don't exercise after an injury. Right? Decreased loading of tendons and it just de increases the matrix degradation. And immobilization for six to eight weeks can cause some significant ligament degradation that may take up to a whole year to recover. So I teach my patients to move. Okay? I teach my patients to go out there and exercise. When my patients uh, go see a spine surgeon and they have uh, a fusion, a couple days afterwards, they're up there walking, they're moving, right? Move to heal, load that tissue. Exercise also improves our delivery of nutrients, right? The rule of the artery is supreme. Who's heard that quote before, right? Our founding father, A.T. Still, the rule of the artery. So we need to improve the circulation through exercise. We need to increase our hematopoietic cells to deliver the oxygen and, all to, and the nutrients to the tissue. Increases angiogenesis, which we're actually making more blood cells, or I'm sorry, blood vessels to that area. And then nutrients enter some of these tissues through diffusion. We need movement. We need um, activation of the tissue to get the nutrients that we just talked about into the discs, into the joints, right? There's no blood vessels that go inside the joint or inside the disc. It requires the movement of these tissues to actually bring the nutrients in and take the metabolites out. So hypomobility, actually, of intervertebral disc, I work uh, a lot with at the spine center, so hypomobility actually changes how the nutrients uh, enter into, into the vertebral disc and makes these discs very fragile. We see these. We see these patients who come in who have fear of movement. They're stiff and they're not moving, and their the discs are degenerating. Their muscles are degenerating. Their collagen is degenerating. We have to teach them to move, right? Same thing when you actually fuse a spinal segment. Those discs uh, usually can degrade pretty, pretty quickly, and the ones above actually degrade even, even faster as well. So exercise improves bone strength. We know that. We, 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 there's multiple studies that looked at patients walking and doing exercise and uh, strengthening exercise, aerobic exercise, and it's been shown that it increases bone mineral density of the spine and hips in postmenopausal women. So when I treat osteoporosis in my clinic, I have them walk outside every day as much as possible, right? It improves your feeling of well-being as well and it strengthens those bones and the collagens and everything else we need. And exercise can also decrease pain too. And some patients can't do a lot of walking because they're hurting too much. They might have spinal stenosis or their knees are so degraded or degenerated they're not able to walk. So I have them just ride a bike. Even gentle bike riding, just you know, leisurely. Look at these people. They're just leisurely riding a bike and having a good time. Even leisurely bike riding has been shown to improve pain in arthritic patients, improves collagen and cartilage quality in arthritic patients. So move and heal. I teach this to my patients every day. We should teach it to ourselves and to our, our family members. Look at that also. These patients or these people that are moving, that are exercising, are pretty happy, right? Happiness comes also from exercise. And can happiness, can our mood, can our mind can our mind may have an effect on how we heal? Can our mind have an effect how our fracture heals, how our tendons heal, how our skin and our, our, our wounds heal? I'm going to show you that. that you, I'm going to try to convince you. Yes, yes, yes. So psychological stress, which everyone has. Who, who does not have stress in this room? Anybody? No, no. Who's got patients that don't have stress? Doesn't, ha doesn't, doesn't exist, right? So psychological stress, unfortunately, it activates the sympathetic adrenal axis, the HP axis, and increases our cortisone, glucocorticoids productions, our catecholamines, and this has been shown to decrease wound healing. It decreases, actually, that, uh, uh, that in, in, in initial inflammatory response. Remember, we talked about the phases of healing. That inflammatory response is very important to kickstart the healing. Psychological stress has been shown to actually inhibit that. Okay, we actually... There's a decrease of the cell function, decrease of the cytokines. So studies of women who are report a high perceived stress have been shown to have a decreased or absence of pro-inflammatory cytokines, right? We always you know, teach our patients or we think about inflammation is bad. Well, that initial inflammation at that in injury is very important. If you don't have an initial inflammation, you will not kickstart healing. And stress, psychological stress, can actually de decrease that and stop it. And this is a really important word, perceived stress, right? Perceived stress. We've got to remember that stress happens between our ears, right? Stress doesn't happen around us, okay? All these things can really happen around us. You can have, you know, all these uh, occurrences happen. But where does stress happen? It's stress, stress happens to, according to how we respond to it. 
And that's what we should be teaching our patients. How do you respond to stress? Yes, we can take out all the financial issues that you're having. We can take out the issues you're having with your spouse or your kids. But can we work on maybe how you perceive that stress? Can we work on how you, how you view your life around you and how you react to it? Stress lowers your sex hormones. So you tell that to your patients. Oh, boy, that, you're going to get a kickstart right there, right? We know as we age, your testosterone and, testosterone and estrogen levels go down. But then acute or chronic stress levels can actually decrease that even farther, right? Uh, pretty quickly. Your testosterone, we know we need it for muscle mass, for muscle strength, for healing. Estrogen is needed for tissue healing and wound healing. And with that acute stress, we can actually decrease our ability to produce that. So can we do something about this? I do teach my patients certain techniques to help them with stress and help them with relaxation. One of my favorite ones is uh, heart meth. Who's heard of heart meth? And anyone here has heard of heart meth? One person, excellent. So heart meth is a group in, in um, California and they teach patients or people how to have heart and brain coherence. How can we connect our brain and heart? I actually found that in the heart, there's like 10 to 20,000 neurons, like brain cells, that actually act very calm, very, um, they're very uh, receptive to your psychological uh, well-being and actually very, very affected by how we feel. So they teach patients how we can connect our brain and our heart through different meditations. So this is a nice study. They looked at 30 participants and they taught them this, this technique for about 30 days and they found that everybody felt a little bit better. They have less moodiness, but their cortisol was decreased, right? And we talked about how cortisol decreases your healing, it decreases your vitamin A uh, function, it decreases wound healing. And they had an increase of DHEA, so they were able to make more of our sex hormones. And this is, this is one of those charts that looks at the heart-brain coherence, and it looks at patients' heart rate variability. So you teach your patients a specific meditative technique, and you monitor them with a biofeedback device to, to see how, what their heart rate variability is like. So at, at first, when people are stressed out or not really thinking about uh, not really being mindful, their heart rate variability is all over. They go fast, uh, slow, fast, slow. But when you get them in this relaxed state, when you make a coherence between the brain and the heart, the heart rate variability starts to become nice and steady. You go from a little bit slower, faster, a little bit slower. And that's, that's when we're in the zone. That's when we are flowing, right? That's when we are ready to heal. So I teach that to my patients and I teach it to myself as well. So other th things have been tried as well. So uh, relaxation techniques have been shown to, to make an effect on pe how people heal from surgery. So a brief relaxation interval reduces stress and improves surgical wound healing. So this is a study of 60 patients undergoing gallbladder surgery, right? And they were taught relaxation and guided imagery technique that uh, they were using and practicing three days prior to surgery and seven days after their surgery. And basically what they found is the perceived stress uh, decreased. Their wound healing and collagen deposition was also assessed at seven days. And they found that the collagen deposition was improved. Their wound healing was improved compared to the control groups. And again, collagen deposition, remember, it, it, it correlates very highly with how strong and how well that, uh, how strong that wound is and how well you heal. So these patients who were doing this imagery technique three days before and seven days prior had better healing, better outcomes. No side effects, right? Woohoo! So I do teach my patients mindfulness. I do teach my patients meditations. Sometimes it's very difficult for patients to meditate at home, so I have them use different apps. Uh, you can get different apps like Calm or Stop, Breathe, and Think. And these are apps on their phone that you can tell them to basically practice every day. And it has usually a woman or a man with a pleasant voice that guides them through these meditations. Like, a, like a, uh, there's one that's it's, it's called... Um, um, uh, it's, it's, it's a guided meditation for relaxation. It's, it's basically relax your brain, relax your head, relax your neck, relax your shoulders. It's, it's a body scan. That's what it is. It's called a body scan. So there's a lot of different meditations that they can get on their phones. And this is very accessible to your patients. They don't all have to go to India or, or go to a yoga studio to learn how to become a yogi. They can do that with their cell phones, right? Hypnosis has also been shown to improve healing. And this is not, we're not talking about stress now, right? We're not talking about, hey, you know, if I make you more relaxed, you're gonna heal well. No, this is actually hypnosis, which is a guided imagery technique for patients to stimulate healing. So in this study, they had 11 healthy adults with non-displaced ankle fractures. 
And all of them received standard care with an orthopedic surgeon and for about 12 weeks. They were immobilized for about six weeks. And then they had serial x-rays every three weeks, right? Half of them got re uh, hypnotic intervention, which they worked with a psychologist, but then they went home and they practiced the hypnotic intervention. And half of them didn't. And the hypnosis basically would tell the patients, imagine healing light in your, in your, in, in your fracture. Imagine moving your fracture. Imagine less pain. Imagine feeling better and moving and being more functional, right? So the hypnosis group showed significantly improved healing. At week three and at week six, their, their x-rays showed improved callus formation, improved uh, bone formation, improved healing, much more compared to, to, to the control group. And they also had less pain, less swelling, improved walking, and improved uh, ankle range of motion. So it's not just relaxation. It's not just, hey, I'm going to feel good and I'm going to heal well. Is there, is there something else? Is there some energy movement that our brain is actually, or our mind, our spirit, our conscious, is that doing something to the healing power, right? You know, we know that there's a lot of energy. We have an etheric body. Who's, who's heard of the etheric body, right? It's our energy body. It's, it's, it's what drives actually a lot of our processes. And this, is, this may be controversial, but there's a lot of scientific studies that looked at, we actually emit biophotons, we emit light, we emit uh, energy, we have a microcurrent when there's a cut or when there's an injury, and actually microcurrent is set up at that wound and it stimulates the fibroblast, it stimulates collagen, collagen formation. So there's energy, there's energy that is being, uh, that, that carries a lot of information to these cells. We don't know exactly how it does it, but we know that it's there, it's present. And this energy is carried to, throughout your body and it stimulates these cells, stimulates whatever else is needed. So this is one of my favorite studies uh, on mind and healing. This was done in India. Um, it was a yogic prana energization technique for fracture healing. Who's heard of prana? Anybody has heard of prana? Or who's heard of chi? Who has heard of chi? So prana is like the Indian version of chi, okay? We don't have an American version yet, but hopefully we will catch up one of these days. Uh, but prana is that energy that is that life, vital life force that go, goes through our body and it stimulates different processes. So these patients were taught how to move their prana through these meditation techniques into their, into their fractures. The, so we had 30 subjects with long and short bone fractures and they were randomly assigned to these prana yogic techniques versus control. And the yoga subjects came to the clinic daily for one week and then they were taught how to do this at home for about three weeks. And then all subjects were evaluated in three weeks. They, they looked at their symptoms, their exam, and their x-ray findings. And these patients had a very beautiful meditations that they were taught. They were first taught how to thank uh, the mother, the cosmic mother, for the energy that's around us. And then they were taught how to breathe in this light, this, these photons, right, these currents, this light into their body and guide it into their healing fracture. Okay, and then we're doing that for quite a while. And then they gave gratitude. I teach patients how to give gratitude every day, right? You wake up and, I am grateful, I am healed. So they gave gratitude that they were healing. They were gra gave gratitude that they were actually improved. They imagined themselves walking and having completely recovered, and then they gave gratitude, okay? So instead of praying, please, please heal me, no. And I teach this to my patients. They were actually imagining themselves being healed. They imagined themselves white light gave me, gave me energy to heal that fracture. They imagined themselves walking, and then they gave gratitude to the cosmic mother. Thank you very much that I have healed. Okay? So what happened, right? What happened? Three weeks later, these yoga patients, significantly less pain compared to the control. Significantly. From 9, nine to 5 after, th or 9 to 0 0.5 after three weeks. And if you look at the control from 9 to 3.7, and this is at the scale from 0 to 10, their tenderness has increased. Their swelling was decreased, right? Their fracture line, very, imp very much improved compared to the control group. This was done by a blinded radiologist. He had no clue who was meditating or not. Their fracture cortices were significantly uh, less, okay? So I teach my patients, and I hope you can too after this, teach your patients, mind heals the body. It can hurt it too, right, with the stress, but mind can heal body. So again, I ask you a question, and I ask, I ask you, and I ask you to ask your patients and ask your family members, can diet, physical activity, and mind stimulate healing and improve function? What do you guys think? So I, I ask you to teach yourself healthy lifestyle. 
I ask you to teach your patients healthy lifestyle. And most importantly, I ask you to teach your kids healthy lifestyle. Thank you very much.